<laughs> okay. Uh, well, I apologize. Uh, this isn't quite related to some of the other talks, um, but I'll do my best to try to relate it um, to a little bit of what's going on um, in Fulton County and around the area. Um, pollinators and fish just don't necessarily relate, but I do spend some time at Imaquan. Um, this isn't part of the study because working for the Nature Preserves Commission, um, I'm trying to sample sites that are in our Nature Preserves pro protection programs. Um, but this last year, I always go over to Sand Ridge and Nightlight and on my way back, um, I go over to Imaquan and take photographs of you know, whatever insects are visiting the flowers. And this year I saw dozens of this rare Bombus fraternus, which is a Southern Plains bumblebee. It is on the species of graze needed conservation, but it's also been identified as a regional priority. Um, so these are a lot more common in Texas, but in Illinois, uh, they are considered rare and um, they are certainly a treat. So there were dozens of them uh, right along the main road there on the common milkweeds this year. So this was uh, in August 7th. So just kind of going over what, I, what I'm doing, I'm trying to collect more data about pollinators within Western Illinois where I work. Um, so I've established kind of baseline uh, species list for all my sites. These are my goals. And I want to find uh, specialist pollinators associated with certain community types and certain plants. And I want to get new ideas for guiding our management within DNR. Are we doing it right uh, to help promote pollinators? I want to collect information to evaluate uh, the quality of our natural communities based on the insects. Uh, here's just a map, if you can tell, of um, just all my different sites. Uh, I'm in year, this will be year four. So I've completed the first three years. Uh, after year five, I'm gonna replicate these again and again until I'm done and don't wanna do this anymore. Hopefully two more rounds and then I'll retire. So we'll just see how that goes. Um, I do six uh, Nature Preserves Commission protected sites every year in West Central Illinois. Um, I selected sites that are a little bit larger. So uh, usually greater than 10 acres, um, with the idea of replicating these every five years. I run four surveys uh, during the season. So I do one in the spring, then June, July, and then one in the late summer, fall. I do a meandering transects for about 60 to 80 minutes through different community types. Um, I basically choose a path of least resistance, whether that be a deer footpath, a creek bed, uh, mowed trails are wonderful because I don't have to waste time you know, fighting multi-floor rows or bush honeysuckle. Uh, whatever is easiest for me to get through and to find the patches of flowers. I document all potential pollinators and flowers visited and I take the photos first and then I record second. What insects to count? I count all bees, butterflies and skippers regardless of whether or not they're visiting flowers because I want a good record. I mean most of the time those all do visit flowers at some point in time. I also record all wasps, beetles, flies, moths, true bugs and ants that had pollen on them or were associated with a sense of uh, just usually a single species of plant or, or genus of plants uh, because I felt those might be contributing to pollination. There were a few other insects like this lacewing, uh, this weird checker beetle that wouldn't typically be considered pollinators, but I observed them with pollen all over them. So I counted them. Uh, here's just an example of my field data sheet, which is a simply a little notebook that I just kind of do chicken scratches on. I write down sometimes common names, sometimes scientific names, and how many I see and what flowers it was on. Um, and then I get back to the office and I translate all that into a formal data sheet that I can keep in my records and you know, read that. Uh, so the results for each year, uh, like I said, I've done it for three years now. And so here's the uh, number of species that I had each year and number of new species, of course, is going down. Um, but interestingly, the number of individuals varies, of course, from year to year. Uh, this last year was a cool, wet spring, so there weren't as many pollinators out uh, in the early time. So I got a lot less. I had more flies, but interestingly, I had uh, fewer uh, individuals uh, by last year than I did the year before. Also, the two years before, I did more grassland prairie areas, and I did more forests in 2020. Uh, so that probably had a little bit of difference. Uh, floral associations, I documented 209 plant species that were being visited, and I have photographed over 94% of all the insects I've documented. Not every individual, but every species, 94%. Uh, limitations on my data. I do most of this by myself, which is great with COVID, um, 
but I'm restricted by what I can do. I'm juggling a clipboard and a camera and occasionally a net collection vials uh, that reduces my efficiency. Uh, my maximum rate for all 18 sites so far uh, has been 400 individual pollinators per hour, uh, 55 species per hour. Uh, I did have one exception where Cindy Owsley pictured here was helping me and we were able to get 69 species per hour with her recording for me. So that way I had uh, my eyes up a little bit more. I wasn't writing down. And so we got uh, 69 species. June is my best month. Uh, these rates are probably close to my maximum efficiency. I don't know that I can actually get more than that per hour. I'm not able to record the number of times I observe each insect visiting a different flower. So I record the different flowers visited by the different species of insects. And that's the best I can do. I'm most efficient when I do two surveys, two sites per day. Any more than that, I get mentally exhausted. Um, I'd like to pause my survey this year and try to do some netting, see if I can actually collect some bees and have them identified. Um, but sometimes I'm spending up to six hours driving. Um, so that time is a big issue for me. Uh, just a few graphs here, just showing kind of the species diversity. Now I'm not able to identify everything to species. In some cases, especially the bees, they're only down to uh, tribes or subgenus, things like that. Uh, a lot of times subgenus with bees. Uh, sometimes the flies, I can only get them down to family. And so, uh, well, I think I know how many, approximately how many species there are, it's not an exact uh, representation of species. When it comes to uh, individuals, I feel like I know the difference between a bee and a fly. Um, so I feel a lot more confident about these percentages. Uh, and you see within the individuals, uh, bees represent over, the, over a third, uh, as you would expect, because bees are far more efficient pollinators. Uh, top plants visited. I thought this was kind of interesting. I, I deal with a lot of botanists. And so what species they're using, of course, is partially dependent upon what species are found at the site and in what abundance, but not always. I mean, there's certain plants that are available in low abundance, but that are highly preferred. Uh, by these insects. But Canada goldenrod, of course, is prevalent at all sites and it is heavily used. Wild parsnip was number two. And these are nature preserves. There obviously are disturbances, but wild parsnip seems to have something in it, the carrot family that is really important to pollinators. So that's one thing I found really interesting that and garlic mustard are heavily utilized. They're very abundant. Um, but when we get rid of these, and of course we should, uh, we need to think about, especially in the case of parsnip, are we putting something back in there to replace it? Are we putting other carrot family uh, members in there so that the insects have the proper food they need? Uh, and this is probably the key slide uh, that everybody's interested in. Uh, this, this third year, I finally started seeing a little bit of a difference between the management that we do. It seems so far, now this is early because I only have three sites that were highly intensely managed, which means they had two or more hot fires within the past five years plus brush clearing. Um, so we call this transformative management. These sites look totally different. They have been transformed. Uh, moderate to low management is usually about one to three burns every 10 years. A lot of times those fires are cool to moderate. Um, versus no management. There doesn't seem to be any difference between the moderate to low intensive management and low management. That's because when we unleash the beast and start doing management, if we don't keep it up and at heavier intensities, we tend to lose ground. Um, if we can't keep a fire on there more than you know three times in 10 years and those are cool fires, then we can't seem to get ahead of the bush honeysuckles and the garlic mustard. And so we sometimes we go backwards, especially with a brush. Um, so, so far, it seems that this high intensity management is having a benefit to a lot of these pollinators. Now we'll have to wait and see, you know, what that is. All these sites are fairly rural, and so there's refugia in the area. So presumably, even if some of the pollinators are getting burned up with these fires, there is refugia, so they're able to come back in when there's more flowers after, after the burn. Uh, I also look at pollinators on listed plant species. Uh, we don't have a lot of listed uh, pollinators or insects, but we do have a lot of plants. Uh, and I want to know, are we losing you know, some of these plants potentially because we don't have the pollinator? Uh, at least in West Central Illinois, that does not seem to be the case. Uh, we do have plenty of pollinators and they do seem to be doing their job right now. That could change, but right now I think we're okay. Um, as far as endangered and threatened species, the greatest need conservation watch list insects, there are very few that are actually on the list. Of course, the monarch, 
American bumblebee and half black bumblebee. Some of these are all species of greatest need of conservation. Um, I am finding these. Um, I'm finding them in fairly good numbers, some of them. Um, and then there's some from our proposed watch list that I'm finding good numbers. But we need to do a lot more to find out which ones might potentially be uh, endangered or threatened or things that we need to be concerned about. What I've learned, uh, diversity is good at all sites. Our nature preserves protected sites, uh, are protecting you know, remnant natural communities. And we still have a lot of good uh, insect diversity at these sites. Uh, some of the non-native plants are serving as critical foods. Um, that's kind of really interesting uh, that they are getting so much visitation by these native insects. The impact of domesticated honeybees was minimal. Now that may not be the case everywhere, but at least in West Central Illinois, um, even though there's honeybees on every almost every one of these sites, and there are some feral honeybee hives on some of these nature preserves, there doesn't seem to be a lot of competition and the potential for spread of disease, um, things like that at this time. That could change, and that's why we want to document that. Uh, community associations are problematic because all the sites that I went to have more than one community type. For example, a hill prairie versus a forest. Um, the bee was looking for a particular good you know, rich uh, nectar and pollen source, sometimes of a certain plant, sometimes not, but it doesn't care whether it's in a prairie or a forest, it will travel back and forth if it can find the plants and the resources it's looking for. So I can't necessarily say, you know, this is a prairie bee, this is a forest bee. Um, I've heard talks like that, and sometimes the things they say are forest bees or actually prairie bees, I mean, it really is problematic. So I, I, just to mention again, this high intensity transformative management seems to be helping to preserve native pollinator diversity. And we really wanna check on that and see if that is uh, true. Um, if so, that could uh, really mean that we need to do a lot more of this. Um, I think uh, similar to the Baltonia decurrence where we're kind of finding the way that we rip things up and we do better with that plant that may be the same uh, with some of our other areas. Not we're ripping them up, but we are doing more serious disturbance to get a hold of bush honeysuckle and get a handle on some of these before they take our, our natural areas. And with that, that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions or you can get a hold of me for additional information.